Thank you for coming on a very busy week. I know that so many activities is happening on the uh, UN or UNGA meeting, uh, but we really appreciate your presence here today. We have an exciting panel um, and in a great topic. Normally we say only bad news make news, but today it's good news is gonna make news. And I hope everybody is gonna rewrite this story. Um, the Yemen civil war erupted almost a decade ago. The UN described it as the worst humanitarian disaster in the 21st century. The numbers are staggering when it comes to death, mayhem, uh, destruction, long-term and short-term effect on the people of Yemen. Yet in this dark picture, there is a glimmer of hope. And this is why we're here today, to highlight this incredible story of multilateral efforts by the UN, by the US, by the Netherlands, by the Yemen government, by every party who uh, played a significant role to make this story a success story. And um, it shows that when the international community have an intention to do something, it actually works. So we hope that this is, will be implemented to other maybe areas. We're talking about environmental issues that could have been four times worse than the Exxon uh, Valdez disaster. Can you imagine the consequences that could have been on the environmental um, effects, on the ecosystem, on the humanitarian issues, everything to do um, with this uh, disaster that actually was averted? So with this, I think I wanted uh, to start with David because the UN has played a significant role. It's not an easy one. <laughs> I think you can imagine just in one agency, it's always different point of views and different opinion, opinions normally conflicting. But this is one actually uh, we managed to, to get to where we are, we are here today. So if you have frame the, uh, the discussion for us, and I will start with you, David. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure, Nadia, to be here with you and Philippe for uh, your introduction. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, uh, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister, Dr. Ahmed uh, Ben Mubarak, uh, Her Excellency, I'm going to try this, <laughs> this uh, uh, Scheinmacher, and uh, of course, my close friend and, and colleague, uh, Tim uh, Linderking, uh, because really, it's, this is very representative of the coalition. It was much broader than this, but it, it took a coalition uh, that is represented here today to see this this through. And it took um, uh, the determination to see it through. Um, and, and I will say this the, without going into detail, um, <clears throat> but a uh, uh, foreign minister will know what, I'm, what I mean by this. The government of Yemen had to take some really hard decisions in, in making sure that this worked. And I wanna congratulate the maturity of the, of the government of Yemen for doing everything they could to facilitate this work, not only in terms of the financial contribution, uh, which was significant at $5 million, uh, but um, the, the political maturity in which that was managed. And uh, someday uh, that full story will be known, but maybe not, not, not today. But uh, thank you very much on behalf of your government for, for having seen that through in a very difficult situation. Um, let me just make a few comments. Um, we, uh, we announced that the, the UN uh, and a broad group of partners on August 11th that we had succeeded in preventing the worst case scenario of a catastrophic oil spill in the Red Sea. More than a few contributors to the project admitted to me uh, since that time that they were actually skeptical that we could ever achieve it, even though they had contributed. Um, and, and I think it, it's, a, it's an example of why determination is important when there is a high degree of skepticism as we, as we saw in this particular project. It took two years of intense political groundwork, fundraising and project planning to find success. It grew out of an initiative initially proposed jointly between uh, the, the government of the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and also a private sector firm, the Faham Group. Um, that proposed what eventually became the, the solution that was implemented uh, uh, last month. Um, we had invited uh, one of the uh, representatives of that company to attend, but unfortunately, 
uh, Fatih Faham of, of that group was not able to, to come here today, but I must acknowledge the fine work that they did to facilitate many aspects of the, uh, of the, of the negotiations, uh, particularly, uh, spe specifically in Sana'a. Um, together we were able to work towards a memorandum of understanding that laid out the principles of this that was signed in early March 2022. Uh, with the de facto authorities in Sana'a. And that laid the blueprint for how we move forward. Um, this gave assurance to uh, outside parties that Sana'a was taking this seriously and allowed us to start the initial work to mobilize the resources. And there I must thank the government of the Netherlands for taking the, the initial lead on fundraising um, with a pledging event that was put together in uh, May of last year. Uh, the results initially were somewhat modest, but it was a catalyst, and that's the most important part. That allowed us to continue to build towards the funding needs that we uh, that we needed. And I think at that point, uh, with, with Tim, together with the, uh, the uh, Dutch ambassador to Yemen, uh, we did a joint uh, uh, round of uh, fundraising. Um, and, and I really appreciated that because uh, it showed the global commitment to, uh, to, to try to achieve the funding required, because we had to deal with political issues, technical issues, funding issues, uh, and security issues in order to overcome this. The, um, the next stage after, after that, uh, we, we actually decided to go for a crowdfunding uh, a program, um, uh, which had some modest success. Um, and we, we saw representatives of, of that last year uh, where even uh, school children uh, were contributing to, to this. And we saw how they raised funds, a couple of hundred dollars to contribute to this. Um, and that was very helpful uh, to the $200, of course, is helpful. But more broadly, the crowdfunding was helpful to bring to the media the attention of the problem and asking why more can't be done financially helping to bring on board the private sector for the first time. And we've received about $16 million from the private sector, uh, in addition to the contributions that you see from the member states there, that uh, has brought us to about $122 million in general. But the program itself that we're implementing is about $140 million. So uh, you, the UN stepped forward internally uh, with a $20 million loan that came from OCHA uh, to support the project. Um, and that brought us to the total that allowed us to succeed in, in the end. So I think this combination of work, uh, this common commitment by all parties to see this through is the most significant aspect of, of, of this. Recognizing a common threat and then finding a way, because it's not easy. Two, two lessons I learned in this. Well, number one, when it's everybody's problem, it's nobody's problem and everybody's waiting for somebody else to step forward. Well, you're looking at the people up here who did step forward initially, and I, I want to reiterate that right, right now. Um, the second thing that I discovered in this is that for all of the contributors, um, the fact that uh, we were doing a preventative action as opposed to a response action made it very difficult to find budget lines within respective national budgets to actually put the money in. It took a lot of work uh, internally by almost every country we worked with to find a way to fund prevention. And, and I think we all know that had there been an oil spill, hundreds of millions of dollars would have come immediately to clean it up. But prevention, nobody wants to, to it's just not built into the system to, to do prevention. So I want to thank all of these countries that had to struggle with that uh, in order to overcome uh, the financial uh, limitations. The private sector had separate issues. They were more concerned about liability of being involved. So we had to work out legal issues uh, for them to be comfortable to make the contributions. And then finally, I have to thank the United Nations Development Program for actually carrying out the contractual work for this. Uh, this is not something, they don't buy very large crew carriers every day. Um, uh, and, and you know, it's a $55 million uh, purchase in a very volatile, uh, uh, dynamic uh, market, um, not the environment that the UN has known so much to be able to manage, uh, but they did. And, and they made that first leap once we had enough funding to purchase the Nautica, which ultimately was the vessel that received the funding. 
uh, the receive the oil, excuse me. And, and that was a firm commitment and signal to everyone that this was now a serious project and that we just needed to close the gap. Um, and, and that vessel was purchased in March of last year. And there I also have to thank the World Food Program because it was their expertise that actually pointed us in the right way to, uh, to actually be able to carry out the procurement. I want to thank the uh, uh, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, because they provided a lot of the uh, technical expertise that we utilized. Um, and OCHA did a lot of work on the, uh, not only the loan, which is a big one, but also on the uh, uh, preparations for contingencies in the event of a spill uh, and, and the kind of uh, capacity development required for that. Uh, so as you can see, it's, uh, it's everybody from uh, a bunch of kids in Bethesda, Maryland raising $200 to uh, an OCHA loan of $20 million to make this work. And I think in the end, that's what I would like to celebrate here today is the fact that uh, a broad coalition, including parties in conflict, can come together if there is a common understanding, a common will, and a common determination to see it through. Be it, uh, be it the member states, be it the private sector, be it the global public. Uh, we had, and maybe the last anecdote I'll, I'll share with you on this is that we had one, one, um, one person uh, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, I'm trying to remember this exactly, who kept contributing to us because he thought this was such a serious, serious issue. Uh, his name is Martin Griffith. It's not the same as Martin Griffiths. <laughs> I don't think we got him. I, th I didn't think we got something from Martin Griffiths, but, I'll, but we got the 20 million, so that, that, that makes up for it. But uh, this, he kept contributing, and, and uh, he was a retired person. We finally told him, stop. You've done your public duty. Uh, we'll, we will work with other people to get this funding. But the fact that so many people cared about this, that so many people wanted this to be achieved, uh, and that tripartite approach of, of member states, uh, private sector, and global public working in common to solve this problem, I think is, 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 is just a beautiful thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Yeah. Actually, if we look at this uh, screen and you can see how many countries and partners and private sectors that contribute to this program to make it a success, uh, it's just incredible of how it came together. But this also cannot be successful without the role of the Yemeni government. And here I'll turn to uh, Minister bin Mubarak. Um, and if you just help us to understand, you know, um, during a war, I mean, we're talking a war that is devastating on the country, yet the Yemeni government played a significant role as well, trying to uh, make this, this program come to reality and to achieve uh, and avert this human, this uh, environmental disaster. So just put us in the picture of what you guys did. Uh, thank you so much, Nadia. And, uh, you know, allow me at the outset just to first thank the uh, Asia Society for arranging this important uh, event. Uh, thank you so much for bringing uh, this story and uh, uh, I mean, uh, inviting all those. Uh, uh, well, I, I will never forget my discussion with uh, with David in, in in Aden several times when we started this project. It's uh, it bumped in my mind all the times. I mean, and uh, he was very confident that together we can do something. He was very uh, passionate about the issues, and the passion is the is the magical word of of the success beyond this one. I mean, without and Yemen always. Always, my, my advice to all the internationals, they came to Yemen, I said, you know, you cannot work in Yemen without a certain level of passion. And also, to, you have to be patient also. Uh, so uh, 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 if you are not passionate, if you are not patient, I mean, uh, go. Don't, don't say, don't, don't say in, in, in Yemen. Uh, this is my first advice. Always I say, I say that. So I thank him and I thank uh, my uh, friend, uh, Tim, whom also, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he put all his efforts, all his energy, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, but also without the uh, generosity and uh, the leadership of the Dutch government and all what they did. Uh, your excellent ambassador, uh, unfortunately, he's not uh, in duty. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, again, all the donors, everyone, the Arab coalition, uh, uh, everyone, I mean, tried to... to uh, to help, and they, they realized, uh, you know, this is something very serious. Uh, uh, 
uh, and this is not a natural disaster, uh, but potential is a natural disaster. This is a man-made. This is something, I mean, uh, we could solve it uh, within a, a day, weeks, uh, month, and less cost. Uh, but to, today we are to celebrate. I don't want to retain uh, to, and to blame who, who caused this problem. You know the, the story about that. But really here, this is a learning story for all of us, learned lesson for all of us. Uh, and that, that, you know, despite of all the challenges that we have, if we focus on some, in certain thing and we bring all the pieces together, uh, we can make uh, a success story. Uh, and this is what happened uh, regarding Safar. For, uh, for, uh, from our side as Yemeni government, uh, day one, we decided not to politicize these issues. Uh, 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 we said, well, this is, if la uh, qadr Allah, as we said in Islam or in Arabic, uh, this has happened, this is will cost Yemen billions of dollars. Uh, I mean, more than 20, 20 billion of dollars, this is direct, direct uh, cost. Uh, uh, countless uh, fisheries, uh, uh, you know, people who, this is the only source for them, uh, will be, if, uh, you know, negatively impacted by, and affected by, the, by this, uh, the ecosystem, the fragile ecosystem, our planet in general. I mean, this is something not will affect, uh, you know, negatively uh, just Yemen, but the, the, I mean, the region, the entire, the entire globe. So that was a moral stance from, 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 from our side. I mean, yes, we as Yemeni government, we were under pressure. I mean, public opinion, uh, public people, you know, parties, a lot of, of ongoing internal politics, which always, I mean, see, the Yemeni government as a weak partner in these issues. We are always the one who make the, come to the middle. And always in, in Yemeni case, in, uh, in our political situation, uh, still I'm struggling uh, to get definition about, the, you know, the middle way. Uh, because always, uh, you know, the international ask us to come to the middle. And I don't know where is the middle because now we are on the edge. Uh, I mean, we don't have any, uh, Always, we are the one who are coming to the middle. This guy with his smile, you know, always. Uh, uh, so, some, sometimes, uh, uh, Tim, uh, same thing. I mean, always we are pushed to, to, to come. But I mean, we are a responsible government. We, we uh, uh, and uh, this is something we do it not, not to satisfy the international community at all. I mean, this is something, you know, for us, for our people, for our uh, land, uh, for. So uh, 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 we took a certain difficult, uh, you know, decision, political decision on all, on all, uh, on all level, and we tried as much as we can to 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 be positive and to respond. It. Yes, we own the vessels. Yes, we own the oil. Uh, but this is now the issues of of ownership. The, the most important thing is the ownership of the issue. Uh, uh, no, not the ownership of of materials. Uh, so that was our position since the beginning, and I think because of that we made uh, this, 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 this success. Uh, and that, by the way, is, is our position stands in all other issues, but this is, I mean, a, a, very, a, a, very, a very clear, uh, 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 you know, uh, situation. Uh, we, we, we did all the, we, I mean, regarding the legal doc documents, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we tried as much as we can we, to be very responsive. Uh, we signed all the documents. We facilitated the, the logistics issues. We uh, issued visa for more than 150 personnel, uh, uh, you know, uh, anything needed uh, for the, you know, uh, 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 rescue operation from our side. We tried to, to be helpful and we, 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 we did it. Uh, our team, uh, 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 Safer, Safer company in, in Marib, uh, our legal advisor, he was in a very close, uh, uh, you know, uh, consultation with the, with the yeah, yeah, you know, uh, UN team and with the, with the, with the other do donors. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, now we can, we, we can, we can say that, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, we are safe. So and this is the most, the most, uh, we are, uh, most important um, important thing yet we have to be alert uh, and I, I mean uh, as any uh, catastrophe as any uh, 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 you know environmental threat uh, ongoing threat i mean we, we cannot say that that's it we finish the mission still i mean we finish one phase uh, we have to be uh, i mean caution we have to be alert awake uh, until we continue uh, the rest uh, the second phase and the rest of of of, of the of the uh, operation uh, we are looking forward to 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 work closely with the, with the with the international committee and with the un 
and uh, 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 David team. Uh, and inshallah, we, uh, again, uh, you know, next year we will have something to tell uh, uh, about the, 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 the second phase. Thank, I thank you so much. Peace. So it is uh, passion, patience, and a smile. And a smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before I um, go to our uh, speaker, I want to acknowledge the presence of Prince uh, Turki Al Faisal. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us today. Um, so, Alicia, I'll come back to you. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to go to Tim first. <laughs> so, um, they say when there is a, um, uh, a well, we can implement anything we want, right? Uh, the U.S. has played a significant role, I will say a leading role as well. Um, although there are many partners, as you said, but uh, it was a leading role for the U.S., working very closely with the U.N., so just again, tell us or frame the, uh, the argument about how can, if the U.S. wanted to, uh, <laughs> to get this project to the, f to the final kind of uh, mile or to get it into the implementation phase, actually it can be happen. It's not just the other partners, but also the U.S. Play playing that significant role. Well, thank you, Nadia. There's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Sorry, I just trying to... <laughs> there's a will, there's a way. Um, thank you all. I'm, I'm so delighted that many of you have come out this morning. I'm not sure what grabbed you about this or how much you know about Yemen, but um, it, it really is a tremendous story. I, th I think uh, that the folks up here have played such an important role. Um, but for this sort of coalition, this unlikely coalition, which brought together environmentalists, private sector, You've got, you know, uh, oil companies, uh, school kids, um, and and crowdfunding. Uh, something something caught caught fire. It wasn't the tanker, um, but something caught fire about you know generating interest in this project. And it can't be uh, underestimated how difficult it is to do something in a wartime environment. And and so the fact that that Yemen. Um, and the Yemeni parties came together with a lot of leadership from the UN uh, to get this uh, effort. And so many people responded from different quarters uh, is, is really tr quite tremendous. For ourselves, um, we, we really uh, you know, felt the pull right away. I mean, the tanker has been out off the coast of Yemen unmaintained uh, really since the war began. And so, if, if you read, uh, you know, a couple of pieces that the New Yorker did a few years ago, it was described as a dead ship. There was no maintenance of this ship, and it was filled uh, with the 1.1 million barrels of oil. It was not properly ma maintained to prevent explosion or leakage. At one or two points in the past, there had been leaks. So this was really, this has been described as a ticking time bomb. And that was certainly a motivator for a lot of people. But the fact, again, that I think, as David pointed out, that, that so many different quarters mobilized to prevent something from happening, where here we are at the UN General Assembly in New York on this occasion, and it's disaster after disaster that we're responding to. It's the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's the problems in Afghanistan, it's um, you know, starvation in, in different parts of the world. This tanker is not on the list of crises because individuals got motivated uh, to do something about it. And I think the fact that the, the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, was an early promoter of a solution and put $10 million on the table right away as a sign to the international community, the U.S. is all in. And once we had the 10, 10 million from our side, you know, I felt very comfortable doing the road show with David around the Gulf and around other parts of the world to tap other sources. And our argument was, this isn't just a Yemen problem. This is a global problem. The Red Sea is a vital international a waterway, huge percentage of international food, oil, other products, commerce. Think of the Suez Canal all the way down uh, the, coast of, the coast of Africa on the west side, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt on the east side. The devastation of the fisheries and the ecosystems Many of you may have gone dive, scuba diving in Sharm el-Sheikh. Game over. Um, you could have gone diving in off the coast of Saudi Arabia. This is a pristine waterway. 
and a vital one. Um, and I, so I think it appealed to people from a variety of perspectives. And again, I think the fact that, uh, that, that, that parties in conflict were able to come together is, is something very significant. And I just want to touch on that for a second, because that's also very important as context which is that Yemen has been experiencing, after a very devastating civil war and considerable destruction, humanitarian uh, disasters and displacement of people, a period of de-escalation that's gone on for 18 months. There have been no cross-border attacks between Yemen and Saudi Arabia or Yemen and, and neighboring countries. Uh, the commercial airport in Sana'a has been open for the first time since 2016 uh, for Yemenis to get out of Yemen and also to visit families and get medical care that they could not get inside Yemen. Commercial activity through the ports of Yemen has increased. And thank goodness there's no oil spill to interfere with that. Um, and so there's a moment here, and this is what brings us who work on Yemen to the UN G General Assembly right now, is to work toward the durable ceasefire and the Yemeni Yemeni political talks which have to take place to, to allow Yemenis to decide the future of their country. So it's a very hopeful moment for Yemen, but it's also a very fragile one. In this particular case, as you've seen from the photos, you still have 1.1 million barrels of oil on the Red Sea. It's been moved to a secure vessel. The Safar tanker needs to be towed away, scrapped. The proceeds need to be put back into a UN-managed account so it can work toward the remaining $22 million that are necessary to finish the operation and eventually the oil from the, that's now on the new ship needs to be sold. And that's work that, you know, David is, is spearheading to negotiate with parties that have been in, at war to make this, make this happen. Uh, and again, it takes a tremendous amount of leadership. I think the partnership that we've had with the Yemen government and, and with the UN on this is, is tremendous. And I, th I think, you know, with these ingredients, prisoner releases that took place in April, uh, a Houthi delegation that's just left Saudi Arabia yesterday. Saudi Arabia and the Houthis have been shooting at each other for eight years. They're talking. They're talking about the future of Yemen and how peace can come and how, you know, with full backing of the Yemen government, whose president is here in New York with us. We met with him yesterday. Uh, and so it, it's a it's a moment of opportunity and hope, and we're you know we're keen that this that this moment be seized, and this is in some way a metaphor for all of this. The fact that this ship, the environmental uh, disaster, could be averted with the help of of so many people. So thank you. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. Um, <clears throat> I remember actually covering wars and conflict in Africa. There was a phrase that stuck with me almost 20 years ago, which is called donor fatigue. That the international community doesn't know how many conflicts they're going to cover, how much money they're going to give, etc. And especially that we were talking in early in, uh, in this um, discussion about preventive. It's not just a disaster happening in front of our eyes, like we see, for example, with the earthquake in Morocco or uh, what's happened with the floods in Libya, etc. So that takes um, an incredible effort for all the parties to convince everybody uh, to come and to donate. And Netherlands was leading in this role. So I'm going to turn to you now, Madam Schaina Schamer, if I pronounce the name right, close to you. Um, <laughs> And tell us again about uh, why you were motivated to be part of this uh, project and um, how uh, you started the ball rolling, basically, of tr trying to get all the money that minus the $22 million that um, Tim is talking about. And I think I have a solution for you at the end of the panel for this. We'll ah. <laughs> um, well, I understand uh, and I, I recognize what you're saying about donor fatigue. Um, but I think, and especially uh, uh, Tim uh, summed up uh, just some of the crises that we're facing uh, actually now worldwide. Um, but for the Netherlands, this was really a no-brainer. And uh, um, I think uh, the, the business case was quite simple and logical. Huh? Um, it uh, was, well, the, the number grew a little bit, but now finally it's come to 140 million 
uh, euros to uh, uh, to to clean up uh, the the SAFR, but the cleanup cost when there ha would have been an oil spill would have been amounted to 20 billion. Mm -hmm. And the ecological disaster, the humanitarian disaster, um, I think we cannot even fathom um, what would have happened, how the Yemeni uh, um, people would have been affected. So for us, it was a no-brainer. But we did found. Uh, we did find that uh, we needed to do this together. So that's why I'm also uh, proud and uh, and grateful for all these uh, these nations and uh, not only uh, uh, nations but also the private sector uh, to get involved uh, and to really uh, uh, donate and uh, to get this uh, money together. We're not there yet, so we still have uh, uh, we still. Uh, have a way to go, yes, exactly. Um, but having said that, I think we all owe a big thank you to the groundbreaking work uh, by David Gressley and also the UNDP, obviously, mm -hmm. the FAHEM group, uh, the Yemeni government, um, Tim and his team for also, uh, uh, um, um, I don't know, uh, hunting down uh, people who can uh, can donate and uh, and uh, doing your uh, your tour, um, and of course the Smith Selvage experts as well, the company that uh, did um, that pumped the oil out of the tanker, and um, I do think that this is an important lesson uh, with all the crises that we are facing that we can definitely if we cooperate, we can really make great steps and important steps and. Uh, you cannot do this as a government alone. Um, um, we really need to, to do this together. Obviously, our multilateral system is under pressure. Um, but this operation really proves that we can still rise to the occasion. And um, um, really, the world, and particularly Yemen, really need us, uh, needed us to act, and so we did. But as I said, and um, I really wanted to uh, speak of the happy ending, but we're not there yet uh, because, um, well, obviously, uh, to complete the whole uh, operation, the rusted ship needs to be towed away and scrapped. Uh, this requires funding, so we need more funding. But most importantly, also for Yemen, uh, the country is in ruins after more than eight years of war, and uh, we really need to step up also when it comes to humanitarian aid um, and not only for the SAFR, but also for the for the people of Yemen, and um, of course from the Netherlands, um, um, we will also uh, um, um, participate in that and uh, support this and support keep supporting uh, David in his mission to achieve a just and sustainable peace. And we do our utmost to improve the humanitarian situation as well. But this is a success, and I do see it as a momentum for further steps to go. Thank you very much. Um, let me go back to David. So we're talking about this intense diplomacy. And it's vital to get uh, this project um, moving from just planning to implementation. You're based in Sana'a. The elephant in the room are the Houthis. Uh, they control the port. Um, they denied the UN delegation twice that actually you were trying to, before the UN was trying to solve this problem before. Um, how, tell us about the, this, this art of diplomacy. How can you get these people to agree with you, different warring parties, and to say, and especially we're talking about prevention, not dealing with actuality. How did you do it? Well, first of all, I have to say uh, it was not difficult with the government of Yemen. It was a very good cooperation from the beginning. I'm not exaggerating um, because of His Excellency's presence, but uh, that was, that was the, the easy the easy part. I think um, in, in Sana, um, you know, they, they, the authorities there acknowledge their own isolation um, as, a, as a factor. And uh, there's a high level of distrust of, of the outside, uh, outside world, frankly. Um, and so I think one of the reasons the previous uh, efforts didn't really succeed is the lack of presence in Sana itself. A lot of that was done remotely, um, partly because it was during the COVID period, but partly there was a, a thinking that people involved in that should be separate from those on the ground. 
uh, which uh, in my view was a mistake. Uh, you, you can't esca escape dealing directly with, with the leadership, uh, the de facto authorities in Sana'a, whatever you think of, of them. Um, and so it's a regular contact that uh, I think in the end built the, the level of trust sufficient to be able to move ahead on this. Um, you know, we even discussed that earlier. They have to look you in the eye and believe that what you're saying is true and that you will deliver. And, and in the end, we, we built the trust that we would, we would deliver on, on, on what we trust, were. Trust in America. <laughs> and shouting in his face every day, death to America. <laughs> They always apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, he asked me once how I. How I did. <laughs> um, the the I and, and you know from our point of view, just to, on that, you got to keep your eyes on the prize, as the old saying goes. Forget the baggage, keep your eye on the prize. What is the essential? And this is what uh, Dr. Ahmed was saying earlier. In fact, keep your eye on the prize, and and don't let all the distractions distract you. And, and so you put aside the animosity, you put aside the crit criticism, you just keep moving ahead towards, towards the, the ultimate goal there. And, and I cannot underestimate either the role the Faham Group played as a, a, a private sector entity that also facilitated contacts and helped build that trust as well. So um, it, it was a combination of things and, and the willingness to dedicate the time uh, to make that relationship uh, work um, for that specific cause. Um, someday I'll go into more detail than that, but uh, I, I think that's probably good for, for now. Okay, great. Um, so let me go to you, Mr. Minister. Um, how, what, do you think that uh, the atmosphere of positivity, maybe this negotiation that started, although we're not going to talk politics today, we're not going to talk about the ceasefire, etc., but we really want to focus on Safir. Did it create a goodwill uh, to allow to this uh, agreement to, to, uh, to see the light, as they say? And how could it be happening that quickly? What role did the Yemeni government play to speed it up? Uh, well, again, I, I thank uh, Tim because he bring the political angle to the discussion when he talked about, you know, uh, you know, the situation. And I have to correct something. I, well, I mean, uh, first, yes, we increased and we see now commercial, uh, more commercial, uh, I mean, ships to Hudaydah. But Aden, uh, I mean, now Houthi is banned, uh, you know, uh, any commercial to come to Aden. I mean, they, they put restriction on all, uh, you know, a private sector. They cannot get any any goods through Aden Airport, which we as Yemeni government, we lost not less than 50% of our uh, non-carbohydrate uh, uh, you know, revenues because, because, because of that. Cooking gas from Marib. I mean, during the last eight years of war, we never stopped supplying the, uh, you know, the, uh, all Yemen, uh, including the areas uh, controlled by the Houthis from uh, cooking gas, uh, even during the difficult time when we, when Marib was under attack, I mean, Houthis, I mean, in daily basis, we lost 23,000 lives in Marib, and we never stopped, uh, you know, supplying the, you know, uh, cooking gas. Now, uh, you know, after we, uh, you know, Houthis uh, port opened up without any restrictions, and Houthis get uh, free uh, cooking gas from, uh, you know, from the region, from uh, specifically from uh, Iran, I mean, they stopped the cooking gas, which again put more, more, more uh, economical burdens in the Yemeni government. Since uh, uh, August last year, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't, uh, you know, uh, export any barrel of oil, uh, uh, you know, now almost a year. Uh, because Houthis in October, they, they, they attacked our oil, uh, oil facility. So now the Yemeni government, which our budget depends on the uh, oil exploitation, 70% of our, our uh, revenues, with, uh, without the 1.2 billion Saudi uh, donation, I mean, uh, 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 to the Yemeni government last, last, month, uh, last month, the entire government, the entire country will collapse because we will not be able to pay salaries, to pay anything. So, and this is still the situation. Still, we are suffering from, from that. Now, the, the uh, 1.2 billion will make us survive for more two, three months. 
Oh, but uh, after that, so all, 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 the, all these, all these uh, uh, challenges we are still uh, facing. Yes, I mean, always in Yemen there is a momentum. Always there is a hope. For me, I mean, the foundation for solution in Yemen is there. I mean, I, uh, 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 Yemen is, I mean, it's not that complicated as any other countries. The road map is there if there is a will. Uh, so and I, I still I still believe in in, in, in in these issues, and if you bring all pieces together, we can we 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 can do real penetration on the on the Yemeni. But uh, for me, I mean, not politicizing suffer and get it out of the political issues. That's one of the uh, one of the issues. Not put it yeah, never suffer. It was one of the uh, you you know special envoy uh, 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 files. I mean, as the prison exchange of prisoner or uh, you know uh, the roots all these issues which is still stuck because it's part of the big deal safar was uh, uh, no it was we tried i mean that was i mean and you know luckily also that, that was the, the the un and also the arab coalition i mean agenda so all we agreed that this is something we have to deal with it i mean uh, uh, diff uh, you know different uh, from different approach or from uh, uh, different angle and that was one of the, of, of the issues be, why we are now celebrating you know, uh, the implementation of first phase, I think because of, because of that. When we talk about good stories, time goes. Look, it's already 10.20. Uh, I would love to ask uh, more questions here, but I think I want to open it for the audience because we have very limited times. So please, I want to remind you, it has to be written. Uh, we have... Um, Ladies here, we're going to collect it. So please write your question on the card and we will I'll read them on uh, behalf of the people who ask. Please ask a question, not a statement, if you can. Um, just for the benefit of trying to get as many uh, different point of views. Thank you so much. And if you want to address a question to one particular uh, panelist, please let me know. Um, the first question is, could the panelists comment on how do we get the private sector to be more involved in something like this? It's not just government, but also the private sector, which also already played a role. Who would like to take this question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm happy to take that because I and, and my team have done so much outreach to, to the private sector, uh, you know, through letters, uh, phone calls, um, American oil companies, uh, you know, your big uh, transportation firms. Um, there's always a lot of sympathy for the story, right? I, I, I don't think there's anybody who doesn't think that I've spoken to who doesn't think it's worthwhile. But getting them to cut a check is, is not easy. Um, we, and I have to commend the UN on another matter because at some point, they were willing to start the operation without all the, without all the money in the bank. And the United States and some key donors, you know, put some, I, I would have to say, some tough messages on the table and said, you won't get additional, don't, you won't get additional funding if you don't show the donors that this is real, that you're moving and having the ships actually start to move into position, I think was a very powerful motivator. Uh, for you know a number of different companies uh, or, or funders. But at the end of the day, we feel strongly that this being not just a Yemen issue, not just a, a, a commercial issue, this is a global issue. And so we, we like to, you know, we'd like to see more, uh, you know, more support from the different entities. This is a great, great group. But there are many uh, entities that benefit from one way or the other, from commerce in the Red Sea. We'd love to see them yeah. come forward. Uh, and again, we have, you know, we've put sizable money on the table as a U.S. government, uh, and we think that should be a motivator for, for others to come forward. It's a very important point, actually. All these people who benefit from this um, commercial opening in the sea. Including the Yemeni private line. sector. I'm very proud to say that. Also, not just the Yemeni government, but also, and you know, uh, taking into consideration the, 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 the economical situation and the, uh, the challenges that the private sector in Yemen are facing. But uh, generously also they participated each as a group yeah, on the top of the, of, 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 of the list. So I'm also very proud that, you know, the Yemeni uh, private sector also 
contributed to this process. Yeah, I don't think it was highlighted. And yet. they were the first to contribute yeah. oh, on wow. the private sector, the private sector. which so that was blazed also. the way for others wow. to be more comfortable to do so. I th where, where I think we're a bit disappointed, uh, the oil industry a bit, though I think they could do better, shipping industry, which actually had a major stake in our success they in terms of movement through the Red Sea, didn't contribute at all. Huh. So they're 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 going to name them and shame them today. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully they contribute. You know, we were we were delighted that Leonardo DiCaprio a year ago, uh, and there are many oceans activists in Hollywood that he tweeted about the software. Um, what was missing from that tweet was you got to contribute. He yeah. framed the problem, but he didn't say, "Come on, folks, pitch in." The crowdfunding was was great. That, yeah. as, as David said, that appealed. Across generations and, and and you know young kids and and older folks as well. Your donor from Ontario Bay, um, so we're we're still in that we're still in that process. You're getting close to my key. idea. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to raise the twenty-two million dollars. Okay, um, another question: Who was the guarantee of the twenty billion dollars OCHA loan, and are there any difficult issues um, of this agreement? Who is the guarantor? Yeah. 20 million. Uh, well, the 20 million was a, a, a loan. Oh, I'm sorry, 20 million, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, we need 22 million, but 20 of it will oh. go to reimburse OCHA, basically. There's no particular guarantor. It was OCHA making the, the transfer to UNDP. UNDP has, a, has an obligation to repay it, um, but can only repay it if, if contributions come in. So at the end of the day, it's a very simple story. There, uh, we need to make both uh, UN OCHA and UNDP whole again. Mm -hmm. uh, they were asked to take a significant financial risk and exposure, and they did it. Mm -hmm. and, and now we need to find a way to make them whole again uh, so that they can continue. And they utilized a fund that, that's used to provide UN agencies funding for emergencies. So uh, that too will be compromised if, if the funding doesn't come back to OCHA for uh, rapid response. So we need to find a fast. It's not a long-term question. It should be a short-term uh, question to, re, to uh, replenish that. So I'm very anxious to hear your $22 million uh, solution. <laughs> <laughs> the suspense here. Um, this question probably asked you, Talisha, before, because you have to leave at 10.30. Mm -hmm. um, oh. So given the success of this operation and the large scale of international cooperation required, how can SAFER be a model for other problems in the future that could be uh, used as an example? Um, well, I think it will be, it really gives us momentum now and it shows that, um, uh, as I said, uh, our multilateral system is under pressure, but we can still, when we need to, rise to the occasion. And um, uh, we spoke about donor fatigue as well. Mm -hmm. People, uh, we have huge inflation also in Europe. And um, uh, so people are worried about uh, their own budget. And so um, um, the, the public support for uh, development cooperation um, is uh, decreasing and uh, the crises are increasing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that this is also serves for an example how we can be successful, how we can be preemptive in uh, the way we can tackle uh, ecological humanitarian crisis. And uh, so we have to, um, uh, we will do that in the Netherlands, but also within the European Union, uh, to tell this story and to tell it over and over and really show this as a success story so people will know why development cooperation, uh, I mean, one situation is obviously always uh, different than the other, but to show how we can be successful in this field. And I'm very happy with the work that has been done, um, but we do need more. We need to replenish uh, OCHA, and um, um, I, I will definitely uh, uh, help uh, with that. Uh, and uh, you can count on our support. That's what I'm I always tell you. Thank you. You know, when we started the panel, I talked about bad news always make um, uh, headlines, but today the good news that's making headlines, and I was really um, touched by the fact that school kids in yeah. Bethesda, Maryland managed to raise $200,000. <laughs> and environmentalists, I mean, environment is a big issue. Uh, we need the media to highlight this issue and to talk more about it. And how can we get people to make, it, to make this issue a major headline?
it's not just the war, it's not just like the conflict, but actually something like this that, that affects everybody. We talked about the what could we cannot even fathom, as you said, of how this oil spell will affect the Red Sea, the ecosystem, uh, the life of, of Yemenis, the shipping lines, everything is going to be affected. So how can we get uh, a public campaign? Uh, and I want to, to thank actually Philip and the Asia Society for really highlighting this issue because often we don't talk about these things. So this is a, a very important, um, even national security, if you want to, to link it to the environment uh, and humanitarian issue. How can we get the, a, a public campaign with the UN, with the US government, with the Yemeni government, with Europe, with, with the media, with the private sector to make it a headline that all of us can talk about it? you like me to answer that? <laughs> I th <laughs> yeah, I just very, very quickly, I, I, I think, well, we, we succeeded in mobilizing 122 million so far. So I, I think we have a blueprint. We may have to redo it again, um, both the crowdfunding as well as the outreach to member states and a particular focus on the private sector. I don't think we've mastered that as well as we, we should. And even some of the foundations uh, that I think could have contributed but did, did not uh, would be an appropriate um, you know, range of entities that we need to, to work on to deal with this type of thing. And uh, because it's not the only difficult problem out there. And, and we need to find ways to address other uh, problems of this nature that just never seem to get resolved. Um, and and uh, so the, I, I hope uh, some sort of a blueprint can be drawn from both the, the funding part of this, but also the coalition building for these very difficult uh, problems. There has to be a, a, a focus and a determination to see these things through. Yeah. No, I, I think, uh, I, th look, this is, it's, this is terrific, and we, we owe Asia Society a, a real debt of thanks for hosting us all here today, um, bringing, bringing uh, this crowd together. Uh, there will be a number of platforms, I think, coming forward, both here and, and, and elsewhere, uh, over the next few months. I, I know that we'll be highlighting this. We do everything in coordination uh, with David, and I think uh, one, one key element here is that for, for, for the success of the UN part was actually David Gressley himself. If you've looked at his bio, he doesn't serve in the garden spots. He goes to the war zones. He goes to, to where the difficult work is. I don't think you could have done this without someone without his particular background. He's negotiated with all kinds of tough, you know, tough customers. And this was the case. And he was doing it right up until he sailed off in one of the ships a few weeks ago. I mean, he was he was out there in the heat and, you know, working with the, the Dutch salvage company and um, so it's it's you know I think it's a huge credit, but we'll you know we're gonna we'll build on this, and I know that um, you know our, again our Secretary of State is a is a real advocate for this effort, and I know that he will be behind uh, you know the multilateral efforts with the Dutch, with the Yemen government, and others, with the Saudi government, by the way, who has played yeah. an indispensable role here. We have huge advocates uh, within the Saudi leadership who've supported this effort, and I know that we will have that going forward. And I'm, I'm honored that uh, Prince Turkey will be here today. Thank Absolutely, you. and I think uh, me and David talked before about this face-to-face -face diplomacy and the fact that we have to give you a credit of living in Sana'a for all these years, trying to actually to negotiate all these tough issues, also the Yemeni government, the US government, the Netherlands, for playing an incred incredible role. Um, we actually um, about to close. So, um, uh, Tim, you alluded to the fact that on the on the tweet they have to to talk about the donation from Holloway, and here we are in New York Hollywood, City, yeah. uh, where multi million uh, uh, dollars have been spent on so many other issues. This is a very very important issue. There are many millionaires here, and we appeal in them today in New York City, please come up with $22 million, not all together, but 
you know, one million here, two million there, it will make up the difference because this is an important issue. And if all of us tweet that and ask for, I don't know, uh, Bloomberg or other millionaires here in the yeah. city that can, <laughs> <laughs> that can honor us today with just some contribution towards this because as you said, the problem is not over yet. We still have suffer in its place. We need to move it to a safer shores. We need to make sure that this also not um, uh, causing a problem later or a challenge of any kind and not to be repeated. Exactly. So this is a hopeful day. Uh, inshallah, next year we can come and talk about uh, the end of the war in Yemen. And we have Tim and uh, Mr. Uh, Minister talking about this issue and David that will have, and of course, the role of the Saudi Arabia that was significant, that we'll have a good day. And we'll have good news in the Middle East. It's not just the conflict and um, yeah. everything that uh, actually tarnished our reputation as people, as culture, as um, uh, everything that uh, we are proud of, that next year we can come and we say the war is over and we start in a new era, inshallah. Thank you Thank again you. for all the panelists. Thank you for the audience. Thank you for the Asia Society.